Excellent. Okay. So we're going to discuss the Lion in Winter presentation, and we're going to make sure that all the elements are clear for everyone. So oral presentation is 10 points. You're well prepared. Here's, here's the rubric, which I'm going to post for you. You are enthusiastic and confident. You have all of your points covered. You know what you're going to talk about, so you're talking from an outline. Um, so exemplary is you're well prepared, you're enthusiastic, and you're confident. Participation points are points for your questions to others about their presentation, and that will happen in the chat. So that's how that's going to work, OK? It will happen just like we do when we're having a meeting. It, it, you can hand raise, you can have a, um, you can write something in a chat, you can have a, a question that way. Yeah, a lot of people aren't very good at things like this and that's why we are practicing it. And that's why you're going to do it because when, you're, when you go out into the real world, no matter where you go, and what you do, you need to be able to make a presentation about what your thoughts are on something. So that's why we have to practice this. It's a practice. And this is our practice because we're going to do a final project too. And we'll talk about that. And it'll be much the same way. Okay. So then you'll have your visual presentation. Okay. And that is 15 points. That includes you have a strong impact. <clears throat> Your presentation is, <clears throat> is very clear. Your color, you're, we'll be doing color rendering. So we're going to practice that in color putting color on, it's exciting. The characters are projected. You have good swatches. So that is 15 points. So you'll get all this in your rubric. And then you will, you, before this, this is one thing I want you to start working on. You will create a concept, okay? What is a concept? And we'll, what is the concept? concept would be how you're going to approach this play. So uh, if you haven't read it, this is not going to be clear to you. But there's any number of ways that you could approach this play, right? What is one way? I'll just, I'll just tab it over here. What's one way we could approach this play? Who's, who's been thinking about it? Odalis, how have you been thinking about this play? Um, what exactly do you mean? Excellent. That's what we're talking about. What do you think a concept is? When I say the word concept, somebody Google it. Concept statement. Let's try that. So like an idea. Okay. It's an idea. What else? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, get a lifeline call, ask someone to help you. Sit, call on someone by name. Um, how about Kit? Kit? Kit, can you add to this idea of what is a concept statement? What I have kind of heard from different classes is that a concept statement is kind of like just, yeah, a, a statement of the idea that you have for a particular thing. So it could be similar to like a thesis for like a scientific paper. But like in this case, I think it'd be more like, what is the concept of the show and like themes and what- So you're saying restating the theme 
yeah, restating the themes and then also like maybe a bit about like how you plan to implement it, but like very short and like sweet being like, uh, the theme is like, for example, like um, the roaring twenties, but we want to have it in more modern day or something. If you wanted to have that as like the concept for costuming, then you could do that. Okay. All right. So if we were to synthesize that statement, which roughly talked around the idea of a concept statement, what this would be is a restating of the theme from the director in visual terms. So I, uh, and so you can say something like, this play is about, and you state the theme, because of that, this play is best understood by contemporary audiences in this, in this time period, in this context, in this socialization. So you're going to not only uh, pick a year, and it's fine if it stays in the same year, but a location and a um, and sort of, you might wanna pick a color scheme. You might want to help people understand certain things about the uh, social context of the play. So there's a reason why the playwright sets a play in a particular time period. And you wanna think about that, okay? So it's restating of the theme in visual terms and we're gonna work on that. We'll work on that today. and you're gonna work on your own concept statement. It will not be the same statement for everyone. It will be a statement individual to you because you get to be the designer and the director, right? The director's gonna love your stuff 100% and you have unlimited budget, okay? So it is going to be all seven characters. So in your visual, in your visual presentation, that will be all seven characters. Okay, seven renderings. Then you have your research folder. And this is going to be um, fifteen points. And that can include it can include a cross plot if you've chosen to do one. It will include research images. which are which influence you into what you're going to do it will include dressing lists we've talked about that for each character all seven okay and it will include rough sketches All right, so all of these things will be included in your research folder. And then it will, we'll be looking at the actual uh, rendering technique. So that will be your figures have movement. So they, they appear alive and round, right? Okay. Um, they are, you're using color media. Look at my bad typoing. At least I can do it this way. Okay. So here's the even out balance, 15 points for this. And you have the same points for rendering as you have for research. Your visual, visual presentation and your concept are actually 20 points. So this is, a, this is a small part of the piece. And then I will be looking at 
your growth of skills. So just like last time when we had, you did a redrawing of the first drawing that we did and how much you changed and how, how your proportion had gotten so much incredibly better, how you had really um, looked at all of the elements of the particular drawing and the, then you compared that to your to the sculpture that we were working with that is all about this growth of skills or of skill and then i don't know why i can't when i end somehow oh yeah maybe i can do this no nope, it won't let me i can't go back to this text box which is so frustrating <laughs> i'll have to fix that sorry so growth of skills and then the final one is i'll put it over here meeting the deadline so you meet the deadline you get 10 points you don't meet the deadline you're minus 10 so that we can get our things in on time Okay, let me see about this. I have changed a few things, so. Okay, so that's 85 points. And then I'm going to give you, there's gonna be something called extra credit. That will be I'm gonna, it'll be five points. That's for going above and beyond the minimum. Is that misspelled minimum or that's correct? Hard to tell. That's why I, I believe you have it correct. Okay, thank you, Diego, for for a weighing in on that. So that gives us 90, a 90 point project. And I said 100 points, so I'm gonna change it to 90 because I changed a few things that I don't want you to have to worry about. When is this due, Pam? Yeah, let's look at that, okay? Let me just save this so that I can uh, adjust it for our thing. Okay, let's look at our modules. You'll have, we've been working on it for two weeks. You've had some, your redrawings are helping you with rough, your rough sketches and you're looking at things. So let's go to our modules. Hold on a sec. I have lost the class. No, I haven't. Okay. All right, let's go here. So we're going right to the, the first time we read it, we started reading it here. And here we are right now. Let's see if we were to look at this and the reading this week really discusses the design presentation. So we'll work on that. And Let's do it in, let's do week 10. So that gives us from today, the only thing that you have is your redrawings and reading and we'll just look at that and the, your presentations we do on the week 10, which is, let me tell you what the day that is. 
where is my, I have a little cheat sheet that gives me the weeks and the days. Oh, I, I believe I've left my phone somewhere. So if you guys see it, let me know, okay? Are you hear me working on my papers? Yeah, okay, here we go. So week 10 is April, it's after spring break, okay? Today is, oh no, it's it's uh, the week before spring break. It'll be that, that's perfect. So this is when it's gonna be due. It'll be due the Friday uh, at 11.59 p.m. before spring break. And on that Wednesday, we will do the, um, presentation. So I will put that in the calendar. So you can upload all your stuff by Friday, <clears throat> March 19th, which is the last Friday before spring break. And the presentations will be on the 17th. And it will help you to do an oral presentation because you get feedback and you get all that. So we have, we have three full weeks from now. So start sketching. Uh, what do you have to talk about in your presentation? Okay, so uh, the reading for this week is in your book about a presentation. Here's what a presentation is about, honestly. You convincing them this is the best way for the costumes to be designed. And the way that you do that is you have a passion about what you've done. How many of you are looking at your um, redrawings for this week? Yeah, Sue, have they informed you at all about what the Lion in Winter is about? Have they given you any ideas? The drawings? The redrawings, yeah. Well, that was, uh, I don't know, is that the same time period? Well, you know, if we're in, if we're in 1080, 1183, right, the 12th century, you know, you can, you can choose where you wanna place this play, but you're looking at the time period in which the play is written. Why do you think it's written in this time period? Because it was about the kings and the <laughs> way they, they were. We haven't got, I redrew Henry VIII and he comes after Henry II, of course. Well, you can put that in for this week. Y yeah. He's a Tudor king and you can put him in for this week, about 1450 would put him into Renaissance. And maybe you think that Henry VIII is a great reference for uh, our king. And we, but Henry VIII, in my mind, being from England, was a lot worse than Henry the, well, I didn't you know much about Henry II, but Henry VIII was a really horrible guy. You know, I mean, so, he had beheadings and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right, so this is gonna be one presentation but with all those different elements uploaded, okay? So your oral presentation will touch on, here's my research, here's, my, here's how, I, how I visually am interpreting the theme, and you're gonna present the theme, quote, that the director has given you, and sometimes the director doesn't give you a theme. And what you try to do is you try to make something up so the director will adopt it. And then you show your renderings with the swatches and you talk about each character. One of the things, Diego, that you really wanna do in a presentation is you want to avoid the words, I like. So I would encourage you to never say that. Why do you think that? Why do you think I'm saying that? Because um, you spoke 
in another class about how your ego is not really a part of this play because it's a collaborative effort. Uh, okay. yeah, just so make just so it's not personal, you know. Um. Okay, so it's not personal, non-personal, non-ego. But that's one really, most, go ahead. I was just gonna say that's really hard because even if you're looking at other people's work and other people's clothing from that time period, you're still gonna have an opinion because that's what's gonna pick you to make those choices, right? No, I disagree completely. Because when you're making a choice, you're making it based on often what you would wear and you have to fight against that. So here is one of the reasons you don't say I like. <clears throat> Here's your direct, <clears throat> excuse me. Here's what your director says. I don't. Where'd he go? You throw your presentation away? Does that make sense? What do you do when you say, well, I like this because. So one of the ways you get around this is you really serve the character. The character requires. Let's talk. I'm going to talk about Donald Trump. Donald Trump requires an extra long tie to point to his point of power, which he feels is his genitalia. He thinks it is a slimming look because he is a man who has too many pounds. Generally then the tie is outlined by a white shirt and then by a dark suit worn open so that you get these three vertical stripes going down the body. The pant is generous on the leg so that we don't reveal the shape of the character. The costume of Donald Trump is all about concealing the fact that he's out of shape, that he may not be in the best health and to give him a point of power. Okay, is that helpful? Yeah, I understand that, but are you talking about like the semantics of not saying I like? Yes. Because you want to, okay, but because obviously it's implicit that you liked it if you, it's your no, idea. You don't have to like it. How can you, I guess what I'm trying to get to is like, how can you present something you don't like if it is not implied? Like, or is there more of like because objective? You can, like, you can support the character with something that you don't really like. You can support the character with something you don't really like. And there may be, uh, you know, for example, maybe you're vegan and you could never put leather on anybody. You would never touch leather, but that is not possible in this time period. So they're either wearing leather or they're wearing something leather-like or they're wearing hides and they're wearing fur. Yeah. And that would be something you could say, I'm a vegan, I am 100% uh, opposed to any sort of animal use. So everything that appears to be leather will not be leather. And I'd like that to have a statement in the program. So I, yes, that's, I guess you're right, Colby. It is semantics. Just don't use the word. Oh, okay. You can like something and you should be hopefully happy and pleased about something. There will always be things that you're not pleased about, but you have to present them equally. And then try not to say, oh, this isn't any good. Because everything has merit. And we're in, a, we're in a business of deadlines. We know that everything is up against a deadline. And most of us in theater are deadline driven. If there wasn't a deadline, we wouldn't get anything done. So understanding that, of course, you can always do a better job. You know. After 50 years of doing it, I can always do a better job. Every single time I think I can always do a better job. Every single time I think this is gonna be a disaster. I, wow, I don't know if, I don't know if all these clothes are gonna fit them. I don't know if this is gonna happen. You know, this is, that's your self doubt. But 
when you're making a presentation, you put all of those things aside because you need them to trust your vision. And then it's the only way you can sustain a healthy debate about the choices that you've made. Right? Yes, so let's, I, I think I understand. I was just caught up on the fact that um, like it's implied that you enjoy it because you're presenting it. Like it, it came out of your brain. So it's it's not like it, I'm not going against personal. Like I didn't mean on like your ethics standpoint. I meant like um, like if you're presenting it, it's impossible to know. Like how do you become objective in your own self? I mean, like, I don't like the medieval times, right? I don't like for, right. it's not a look I'd ever wear. But if I'm going to make a presentation, I'm going to choose what I like in fur one versus fur two. Right. So ultimately, you're making a choice on based what you like, even if you don't like it. That's, yeah, that's so true. that's kind of what I'm, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah. Good. You, you try not to get too hung up on it. Just don't say this in your presentation. Okay, okay, okay. Just don't use because saying that, saying that kind of leads people to a different avenue, right? So you're yeah, trying to well, keep it exactly neutral. because it, it allows them to think about do I like that? And then that gets really tricky. Because first of all, you've done the research on it. So when a question is posed to you, you can back it up with research. And if it's a uh if it's something that that is necessary for a character, you can back it up with dialogue. Oh, well, remember when he said this and he fell down in the mud in the stable? He's a, he hangs out in the stable, so he's going to be stinking and he's going to be have you know manure and straw in his shoes. Remember they talk about the sniveling runny nose of John. Right. So you know, think about you're not you're not necessarily going to like his character. And you certainly wouldn't want to have manure on the clothing or whatever, but he think about if they are wearing these long clothes dragging on the floor and they're going through dirt and mud. You may not like the fact that it is muddy, but it is necessary for the character, but it's, you know, and then you have to say, how are you going to do that? You know, but we'll talk about that later. You know, you're not going to put real mud on, right? but you can paint it on and you can put, you can even put three-dimensional things on and make it work. So let me set up a presentation for you. It'll take me about just a couple minutes. I'll go get it. I'm gonna tape it on this board. Okay, for example, you can choose how you present the material. You can choose to present all of the sketches at once <clears throat> and lay them out so that they can look at everything at once. You can choose who they look at first. 
And does that help define the characters? You can choose in what order people will be looking at things. So I'm gonna do a quick little presentation here for you. And you can take a look at what you think. It's hard to talk about this because I don't wanna show you anything about wine and winter, okay? I want you to think about what you might be doing for lion and winter. And then we're gonna spend time on color media, different kinds of color media on Wednesday. All right, this is a group of renderings for a play. Called Faustus. Sorry, I just got a very disturbing message about my phone. So I'm wondering if it dropped out of my car or something. Hold on. All right, I, you know what? I'm sorry, I need to take a break for five minutes and see if I can track that down. I apologize, and then I'll lay this out so that you can see it. Let's come back at 1025, which is actually uh, seven minutes.
Okay, thanks. Uh, two minutes and then we'll be, I'll have this up. Did you find it, Pam? Yeah, so what happened is, thank you guys for that. Um, somehow I got a message on my computer that said, your phone is being used to sign on from a different location. Will you allow this? Which made me think, holy cow, where is it? And so I don't really normally care that much, but um, I had dropped my car off at the mechanic this morning. Oh, and then I thought maybe it had fallen out of the car on the street and someone had picked it up. So anyway. Now I have located it, the mechanic has it, it's all safe. So maybe they just picked it up and that was, you know, somehow worry, uh, worrisome. So we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about the play, Dr. Faustus. And Faustus, if you know, if you remember the story, sold his soul to the devil. And let's see how how we can get this on all of them on. So he sold his soul to the devil, and we're going to take a look at. His, um, this is, and we're starting with Faustus because the name of the play is Faustus and he's roughly in the early 19th century. So I'm gonna try and make a better different view. And let's see if we can. Go full screen so you get a little bit more. There we go. Okay, so Faustus is in traditional frock coat, waistcoat, shirt, trousers, primarily black with a hint of red and the red coming through in the lining. So to see his um, graphics up close, you can see that the name is printed on there, his name is on, and then the swatches are there detailing everything about him from top to bottom. He's wearing a leather. This is leather and I'm not sure you can tell the texture overcoat. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. Okay, and then his trousers, his velvet waistcoat, his exquisite shirt, with a tiny bit of lace at the collar. And so it's just a detail and a man wouldn't necessarily wear it. And then the seven deadly sins are, uh, my concept for this play is that everyone is a Rosarch ink lot because really you can't sell your soul to the devil and it becomes an interior mind thing. So every character has this mind relationship. So here is an image of an ink blot. This is a research image. And then I found this ad that literally duplicated this ink blot. This was like some kind of weird, like whatever. But you can see it looks like a crab, right? And then this thing looks like a crab. So I use that as the color example, and then also for the relationship of the character of 
gluttony, how his arms come around like the crab, the color of his costume is that. And we're showing a lot of flesh with the very brief doublet or tunic waistcoat that he would have on and his sandals, and he's from a different period. He has elongated toenails indicating his willingness to dig in to his food. His hair is a, a ray, okay? He has a rough cast cloak, leather sandals, and this rough cloth that he'd be wearing. So this is gluttony. Again, based on this, so this, it forms the sketch and it informs the color. Another of our seven deadly sins is sloth. And this is an ink, gross arch ink block for sloth. Note the tiny head, the large body. Also sort of like a crocodile laying in wait for somebody in a pond, a lily pond. Both things are influencing. But again, this idea of, you know, Rosarch ink block is, you look at that and you say, what does that mean? And what is sloth? And this sloth is actually something, someone very beautiful, but couldn't possibly do anything with these, with the way that she's constructed with her green skin, her high, very high heels, her large fingers. She couldn't really perform any duties. And she has her, from her veil to her hat, to her dress, to the touches of color that we see. And then she has feathers that are growing out of her shoulders and her elbows and her wrists showing that maybe she's not all human and maybe she's part avian. Covetous uh, envy. We always say someone is green with envy and they hold it inside their gut. So I'm showing I'm so proud and I'm envious of everyone else. And what does she have? And she is so, she's envious, she had, but she has nothing to hide. She's just going to be in a very brief thong and show her envy of all with her attitude and covering up her hands. And really she becomes the envy of all and that would be her idea. Lechery is a character that generally is played by a man, but in this case is played by a woman. I haven't, sorry, this is not a, there we go. And this is a situation where there is a shear over, and I talked about this last time with swatches. So here's the swatch. And there could be shear, just a minute, let me get this unfolded so you can actually see it. There we go. So she's glittery underneath, showing her lecherous quality, but she's trying to hide that with this muted sheerness on top. And then she has this incredible layered sleeved bodysuit in this blue with its shimmer. Lots of gold jewelry, bright red lips, bright red nails, and then these sheer trousers. At one time these did hold up better. So there you got it. So this is how, well, this is what you don't want to have happen in a, in a presentation is you don't want your swatches to fall on the floor. If they move around a bit, it's not so bad actually, because it gives some life to the character. But also I had these, I've had these in my portfolio. I didn't pull them out. Okay, covetousness is 
one who covets. He also is somebody who wants something everything everyone else has. So he is an, a really great alligator image. And this reptilian character has a boa that goes along with him and wraps it around his body. He has leather, partially leather trunks on, this uh, reptilian implied tank, jewelry, larger than life hands, really a big mouth, and then large feet. So if he doesn't have a real snake, we'd be making a snake. So you can choose to put everything up at once and then reveal, or you can choose to put things individually up and tell them the story of the play. And of course, they should know the story of the play because they're doing the play. I have to get that up, so hold on a second. There we go. There we go. And then wrath. Again, another, we go back to the interior ink blot, we reference it for the character and show what his heart of meanness of blood, his big nails, his, how would he have his arms working this crazy way? I'm just gonna tape that up so you can see it. And then we'll have Pride. So those are our seven deadly sins. Pride, very strong and powerful. Mask-like, not showing what's behind the mask with a, a major headdress. There you go. And a very strong body position. He wears his heart around his neck. He has uh, nipple rings and chains attaching his nipples and belly button so that he is, he is strong. He has uh, fangs coming out of his arms. So they're, they're very much not really in the real world because they are uh, mythical. The seven deadly sins are mythical. And then on top of that, we have the devil who is Mesistopheles, who's hidden. And this is much in your, in your vein right now. Have you noticed that when you're in the medieval period and going into Renaissance, it looks like what Star Wars is. Star Wars is just a blend of that with contemporary. So anyway, Mesistopheles is part of the devil. He's covered up, but we can see that he's naked underneath. He is wearing the sleeveless surcoat that's lined with the rich color. And then we see his hood hiding his face so that we don't really know who he is with the golden cord and his really lush gown. But underneath, as we reveal, he's really a nude, again, with some odd bald spots and hair and fur sticking out and hooves and these elongated fingers. Let's see, where can we put them? We'll just put them on top of these guys.
And then we have Beelzebub, another devil. Again, going towards a superhero, trying to show how powerful he is, showing the big teeth, the, the willingness to terrorize you. And how is Faustus going to believe that the devil is going to give him what he wants because the devil has this great enforcer and Lucifer, who is a frightening double-headed creature. So there is a, a cloth, there is a wire mesh, there's other cloth underneath, there is a leaf glued to the space so that you can get all the texture of the character here. So that would indicate if, if I had these four out here, you would see the whole entire play at once. Who are we supposed to be looking at? And when do these characters get revealed? So you get to pick what your play is about. When you do your presentation, you can just take a minute and show us. You can have it on a uh, you can stick it on a whiteboard. You can use a chair back to create a um, easel. So I could do that as well. Can we just put it at, like in Google Slides? Say again, Cara. Can we put it like in Google Slides? You can put it in Google Slides for sure. I mean, you can do that. You can do, you can make a book like this. You know, if you wanna unfold a book, and create an icon for something and do a page through like that, you can do that also, you know, old school research style. This is very common in um, this particular style way is very common also in film. When you have a one on one with the director, you want to bring something for them to see. So this is a, you know, a picture of a person who's the scout and then a scout sketch so that you can see everything together. other characters. So, you know, it depends on how you want to present. If you put it in Google Slides, that's completely fine. You might find it handy to make a small, this is done with oil pastel, a small version of it that you can quickly do the color on and see if that's going to work. And then put it into a larger sketch where the sketch is taking up more of the page and you're seeing everything. The two, two of the daughters for King Lear said in the 60s. Okay, so that happened to be just a particular show. So yes, you can do it in Google Slides. You can do it any way that you want, any way that makes you feel more comfortable. Okay. So questions. Thanks, Cassandra. You don't, they're just, um, you know, you just, a lot. And I'm not saying that, you know, I like having this man necessarily nude. It's just that he's so bad. It just felt like he had to be, look, I'm trying to disguise myself, but I'm going to really show some things off. So, you know, it's just, an, it's just how do you want to feel about this play? How do you want them to feel about this play? Well, first of all, you want them to feel like, when you're looking at this play, Faustus, you're thinking it's a sensation. Because when you're doing something in mythical proportion and it's outside of our actual realm of living, you want to make something bigger and more shocking. And uh, I mean, okay, so this tech probably is not that shocking necessarily because seriously, you go down Venice Boardwalk and you see people like this anyway. But it is surprising when you put it into the theater and you show it to the audience. So that's just something that you want to 
keep in mind. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the color media that's used. Okay, I talked about one thing um, in the other one, so let me show you. This is, this is both watercolor and also something called Dr. Martin's ink. A lot of graphite, there's actually no, yeah, there's no ink outline here at all. And then to make certain emphasis like the hooves, that's the thing that is the most vibrant on the page, okay? And yet when he is Mesistopheles, you see that the hooves do not have that same impact and imagine the sound that he could make so that when this is takes when he takes off the gown and his hood and he reveals who he is imagine how he sounds so it gives him a lot of power to have that kind of animal or it re references back to the satyr of the um greeks so it's an interesting place okay and then there's watercolor this is actually watercolor crayon and then some Dr. Martin ink in there. Uh, I'm famous for using Sharpie right here. Thin Sharpie, a belly button, a few hairs on his head, on his body. Uh, this is actually a watercolor crayon. So I got some texture and then I could smear it around. So, you know, whatever you wanna use, just uh, figure it out. For me, if I'm stuck and you can, I, pull swatches and I make a pile for each character. So somehow Sloth just felt like she needed this. It ended up that it worked on her face. And then her Avon creature with feathers. This idea of putting something real in like a feather, to me is it just speaks to the individuality of the character. So she has a, she's not only part feathered creature, but she's actually plucked one and put it in her hat to wear, which is bizarre. So then you think about how creepy and disgusting that particular individual is and that they would pluck out their feather. And then, you know, this idea, this is a leather swatch. Now you can see it a little better and it has a texture on it. And this would be for the overcoat, the frock coat, with this uh, brocade lining, let me see if I can get you, there you go. You can see that it's embossed. So you're not gonna see the embossed pattern on stage, but you're gonna get the idea that it has this different textured idea and it's darker than the leather, okay? So you can see the contrast of the two. So that would be the detail here, here. The lapels would be the red, lifted up and back. So I've given you a great piece of red to see that. And then that tiny bit of lace around the neck, no tie, which would be very unusual for that. And then this velvety um, waistcoat, and that's done. This red is a Dr. Martin, I love that color, but this one I think is um, these watercolor crayons. So I wanna talk to you, this is pastel, and we'll talk about that. So, One thing about pastels is you can make, they, and this is why I say don't erase, Diego, is pastel gives you an instant hit and a lot of color, okay? So, here we go. Uh, let, me, let me go to the chat first before I talk about that. So there's something about, uh, are we, yes, you're doing the presentation on Lion in Winter. I specifically did not want to show you Lion in Winter because I don't want you to be influenced by something that I'm showing you, okay? That's why I don't want you to watch the movie. But if you've already seen the movie, I'm, I'll tell you a little secret about the 1968 movie in a minute. So you can decide if you want to change the time period from 1183, 1083, right? Isn't that 1183? Wait a minute, where's my script? Okay. We did this last time, you guys, how can we do it again? 
it's Christmas Eve, right? 1183. So I was right the first time. That's what the, that is what our script says. If you are compelled to change the time period, then you must give a reason why that time period is going to give your audience more of the impact of the play than the time period in which it's set. And it's just, this is just like a, in a court where you have to prove somebody guilty, you have to really make your case for why you're changing it from where the author set the time period, okay? You make your costume choice, choices based on 1183. Right, thanks. Thanks everybody for that, all helping me out. Okay, so this questions on the, any more on that, that thank you very much for that. So a couple of things, one of the things that's fun to work in is you can work small. My rough sketches for the King Lear were like this. I did all of them like this. I did, I've done, if you have to do like 46 or 47 sketches or more, then working small can help you work faster. So this was actually penciled in and then I copied it. Okay. But I could color in with these, with my pastels and these aren't my pastels from home. These are the pastels from here, but I want to show you what they look like because they're really cool. And it helps you work things out very quickly. So uh, like I said before, get your body that you like. You know, I'm not saying I like it, but it's the proportionate body for the character. And then copy that or retrace it so that you can make a lot of mistakes when you're putting the color on. Those become your working sketches. Those are your rough sketches. If you want to show four of those, that's fine. They can all be in the same attitude. But when you work towards the final, then you'll make it bigger. Okay. And so she's now a little more complete, a little more vivid. We know this is a super shiny, you know, uh, like a Supreme stress. And that's a reference because three sister, three daughters of King Lear, three sisters, the three Supremes, sort of this whole, you know, mind boggling thing. But you can work this way until you get something that you like. And then you can say, oh yeah, I know how to put that in. I can just do this in watercolor. You can keep them in pastel. Pastel just moves around a lot. It means it's a little bit smeary. So let's take a look at that. I think I have a piece of paper. And then when you do another character, do them in a different pose. Still strong, Cordelia is the sort of sympathetic sister, right? Regan's a conniving one. That's why we gave her the smart glasses and the feather hat. But Cordelia is the kind of nice and kind and right. She is not a Supreme. She's based on Jackie O. But notice her posture is even more towards her kinder, gentler, the younger sister compared to this one. So you wanna think about what your characters are in comparison to each other. You can even put it on a black ground. Now let me get a piece of paper, which I thought I had one right here. Because I'll show you about, uh, here's some just really reasonable cheap oil pastels. These are called crepa. These are non-toxic. But you can even put them on black and you get you can get highlight and shadow happening very easily, right? It's a beautiful way and it's fast. So if you're doing a bunch of these, it works. You can even move them around. If I want to create something like a feather. Okay. Watercolor we worked with and we'll work with that again so that you can have some more techniques with watercolor. You can make color change with this. If I want to add and make it more of a violet or more of a, um, oh, I like this red a lot. If I want to make a, uh, you know, a more dramatic look, you can put, this is, this blue has a lot of green in it. So I'm using the red, which is the color contrast to it to create this idea. I'm, uh, let's see, what is it? Let's see, let's make this some kind of a head. 
thing. So we give it a little context of somebody, right? But the great thing about these is they just work really quickly and you can see them. We can also, you can work on any color paper because watercolor, you have to almost work on white or light color. But this paper has, this is just a fairly smooth piece of paper. This paper has more tooth, meaning it has these, it has a texture to it. So let's see what it, what it looks like if I put it onto this paper. And by the way, sometimes your paper has a side so that one side's better than the other. So again, we're gonna just do our same little headdress. The, the tooth of the page, I can tell the smoothness of the page works with this one. And the tooth is gonna give me some uh, texture, more texture than here. I can still smear it. And this is one reason why you don't necessarily want to use pastels for your final sketches, because if you're gonna travel around with them, you may, sorry, my thing fell in the uh, They may smear. Now you can get around that by putting on a sheer or tracing paper on top. So let's put our red accents in and see how that works. Maybe we want, need a little more fingery action with that. So you can make a very interesting statement, but this is why you're gonna have to start playing around with it because the tooth or the texture of the paper is very evident here. Where here, this is a very smooth paper. So when I rub the crayon on this, you get a very different kind of texture. You can see that you still can have the two different colors. I can put more dramatic blue in here, but the blue is more dramatic on the black because it's lighter. But I could add black in here and that might be a great dramatic touch for the white piece. So let's just try that. And I'm gonna just give it some extra shape with the black. Actually, I think I'm using gray. Okay, but it does create, I'm gonna to have to put it down because I need more, I need to have my hand, I need to on a hard surface. So, If I have it on a hard surface like this, then I can actually push on it, right? And I can actually make some kind of darker shape. And we should, we're gonna try this on uh, Wednesday. So come with whatever colors you have. Let me see if I put the blue up against that, if I'm getting as much of a contrast or more. And maybe, you know, I'm exploring it and I decide that I like this better. So maybe I like the white. But the great thing about, um, the great thing about the, uh, the um, oil pastels is that they make a very quick color statement. And so, you know, this one was very dramatic. I loved this one, but now that I have added the black into the white one, maybe I prefer this, you know, it's a whole different character, right? Let's put them side by side. So, you know, you can, you can use same material, the same exact color media, and two different, completely different outcomes because the paper is different. You know, you can put things, it was a while, for a while it was, it was popular to put things on top of newspaper and then you mount the newspaper to another paper. It, very difficult to use water because newspaper just disintegrates. So, you know, there's always that possibility. Um, so that's part of the presentation and the rubric, I'll upload the presentation. I will 
upload it so we have it on Wednesday with the rubric and then we'll our, with our due date of March 19th right before our time to go on mid on our spring break okay so I know it's difficult let me see if I can go I saved the whiteboard I wonder if I can find if I can if we can go back to that now that you've seen that it might be helpful Let's go to Oh, I think I can only go to the whiteboard if I screen share. Let me see if I can do saved whiteboard. No, yeah, there we go. So your oil presentation and how you unfold your sketches to your viewers, that's us. Then you as the viewer, what question do you have for them? Everyone's working with the same play. So everyone will have their own really specific idea about how their play should be presented. And yet we're very eager to see what someone else does because maybe you'll learn something even more exciting from them. There's always that possibility. I just love working with you guys because you bring so many great ideas. So your oral presentation, you're gonna do an outline. You'll talk about why you place this time period. You're gonna verbally say your concept. So type that out so you know exactly what you're going to say. Basically, it's a justification for why you have put this play in this context of time period, of location, of season, of all those things that we talked about, about uh, character and plays. You can demonstrate your research photo or you can just do what show a few research images if you have a basic if you have a visual if you have a visual concept that you can tie to it then by all means show those your dressing list for each you don't have to show us that's just going to be uploaded and your rough sketches that might be informative like you saw the miniature reagan and then you saw the big reagan that might be helpful for us to see if you think that's great you'll have an amount of time to do this and i'll figure out exactly how much that's going to be then your rendering technique, which we'll see, growth of skills, and then meeting your deadline. Okay, so now does it seem more clear? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, when is this all due? March 19th. Okay. Okay, we'll present on the 17th. And then the 19th is the Friday before spring break. So I want you to have it over with by then. Good. What else? Any last questions before we take our quick break? Because we have another, I know that some people have to leave. So uh, one thing is we will be having a midterm. So that will be next week. And remember, if you look at our overview, which you can find in the overview. You will see that we're having a midterm next week. It'll be on the book reading and we will do a, a prep on that, okay? So does everyone remember where to find the overview? So it's on your Canvas page. So that'll be happy birthday, Aspen. So on your Canvas page, here's the, this is the very top information, weekly topics listed here. So you can see that at the end, it gives us the objectives, the expectation, here's what we're doing. Okay, all the reading assignments, all that stuff. The midterm will be on Monday the 1st, and on Wednesday we'll have a guest speaker. And then we'll set up a mannequin to draw from. So that'll be kind of fun. Uh, so we'll, we're gonna do the midterm prep on Wednesday, and we're gonna talk about, when we come back, we're gonna talk about the historical project. So that is, close your eyes. 
That is for the last week of class. And then the final class period is where you, you will present the final play. And we'll talk about that. I have an idea about that that's slightly different. All right, it is 11.03. Let's take a break seven minutes till 11.10. And I will see you back here. And I'm here if you have a question before and uh, you can take a break, but I'll just be right here. I'll just give you a viewpoint of the research, the quick sketch, and then the final leer. So you can see the whole thing together. It gives it, uh, it just articulates more of the character. And then one other thing I wanted to talk about with the paper is that I, if you don't, if you have only smooth paper like this, you can always put it on top of something that has a texture like a, like this notebook. Okay. And so I'm, I can make a mark on here. This is just a, this is a Crayola pencil, but you can see how you can get different texture on here because underneath there are little pebbles on this board. And then I can even move this around a little bit if I add water and a brush and I can move that pencil around and I can watch what happens. It will go on and off of the color. And it, when it dries, it can become something very interesting because the pencil itself then creates a different form. So always experiment and when this dries, we'll, sh we'll look at it again. So don't be afraid to experiment. That's why I would like you to make copies of your rough sketches and then be able to color on them a bunch of times and try it with different paper. And you can just either um, scan them on there, Xerox them. You know, I'm totally old school. I, I don't know how to do anything. I got an email the other day. I couldn't even understand what they were talking about. Um, so you want to uh, just really think about what it is that you want us to know about your line in winter. Okay. So historical. On our modules, you'll see that you will be doing a historical presentation. And that's the last week before school ends. So it'll be May, no, April 26th and 28th, okay? 26th and 28th. So that'll be right before, uh, well, that'll basically give us a break before we're doing our final project. And you can look at any section in the labor book, but I'm suggesting that we work with the 19th the, and the 20th century, because a lot of people, um, we have to go through that very fast. A lot of the time periods before the 20th century, before we are in, dec in centuries, and then they're in half centuries. And then we get to the last half of the 19th century, and we have different looks for 1865, which is the big hoop skirts of the Civil War period. The hoop goes away, the skirts are pulled up in the back and we get the bustle period for the 1880s. The fullness in the back stays for 1890s. And then we start getting a decade by decade look from 1900 to 1910, the beginning of World War I and the influences of war on women's clothing, the 1920s where we have the excess 1929, where we have the crash of the stock market and the depression and the thin man in 1934, which is in the middle of the depression. So the clothes are more reserved, closer to the body with a little flare at the hem. And then we get the war influence for the 40s, where things are militarily influenced because of World War II. The 50s is a period of um, where we have this false idea of prosperity. The 60s greatly influenced by the election of John F. Kennedy, the youngest president to date with his very beautiful younger wife and young children. So in the United States, it influences and influences worldwide. 
this beautiful picture of Camelot in the 60s. However, at then at the, by the 60s, we start getting half decades where in 1967, we have Mary Quant, we have the Viet, which introduces a miniskirt. We have the Vietnam War, which introduces a, this hippie look for the, you know, comes from the beatniks of the late 50s, but then it moves into hippies. It becomes in popular vernacular. We get into the 70s. So then we're starting to split decades into five-year segments. So I want you to think about a time period that you feel like you'd like to do some extra research in. And I'll give you a rubric for the um, presentation, but you'll show us some research. You'll give us the fine terms. It's much like a presentation of a redrawing. Okay. So what I hope you will you will put those in an assignment page, and you will be matched with someone who has maybe a similar interest. So there will be two people working together. And I will set that up in a discussion page so that you can, you'll be a discussion group, just the two of you. You can share materials back and forth. You can just, it'll be a way to meet that way. You can choose to meet that way or not. A lot of people choose to just, they just want to do it by phone or FaceTime or now that we have Zoom. Um, we didn't, before the pandemic, not everybody had Zoom. You were doing, sometimes you were doing Skype, sometimes you're doing FaceTime. So I think also this school offers, uh, Google Hangout Duo, so you could do that. But it will be in a discussion group. You'll have your own, you'll, you're, you will be matched together with one other person. It is a collaborative project because we work collaboratively in theater. And sometimes that makes you wanna tear your hair out. And sometimes it makes it so much better. So um, that will be on an assignment page, but I want you to begin. And the assignment page will, the first part of that will say, please submit your time period. <coughs> I'll have you do that by Sunday night at midnight. So that will be, where's my, here we go. I don't have my phone, so I have to keep looking at a calendar. Okay, so that would be by, uh february 28th you need to submit your historical choice okay and then i will upload the um lion in winter project and the rubric that goes along with it as one assignment. So it will all be in one. Whereas Thin Man, we did all incrementally, we did it all together, where we started with the cross plot, and then we did rough sketches, and then we did sketches. This time we will do all in one, the uh, whole concept for the whole presentation for Lion in Winter. Questions on those two things that will be coming. I'm going to put it in this module, although the due date, remember, is March 19th. But it will be in this module, so you have to go back to this week to refer to it. You know what? No, I'll make it its own module. I'll make Lion and Winter its own module, so you'll be able to see it as its own thing. Don't you think that would be helpful? So we can just, yeah. I can put on different things on there, little lecture points or pages, but the assignment will be its own module. And then it will say do on that module, be really big so that it doesn't have to repeat through weeks. Okay. Yeah. Can you um, explain the partner one yeah. again? Like what, maybe whiteboard oh. it, like what? It sure, entails. let's whiteboard it. And, but hold on, before we do that, I will whiteboard that right now we will discuss it again so don't worry about okay. that but then remind me i want to talk about the final project the final design because i have two different ideas and i'm going to let you have a little bit of a vote okay screen share white whiteboard let me get a new one i'm sure i can get a new one Here we go. All right, so the historical project. All 
All right, the first thing you're going to do, pick a time period and pick a specific, pick a time period that is specific and narrow. So you don't want to pick the second half of the 20th century because that would be 1950 to 2000. That's way too much material, okay? You want to pick something that's specific like I, like I just illustrated to you. Maybe you want to pick the early 60s. And then you will look at, uh, and you'll have this in a rubric. You will look at the time before how it influenced what came after. And then, so you look at what, what, what the time period was before and then how the time period you used influenced what came after it. Okay, so you'll see it within the context you see your time period in a context of what comes before and after. Oh, damn, I can really not spell. So that's part of your research. Then you will look at images from that time period. You will show a redrawing to explain vocabulary. So a redrawing really helps you say, you know, this is a this is a chapeau, this is a this is a hood with a lyrope. If you see the if you see the hood, wait a second, I thought I had this. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, when, when is this project due? Okay, so this is due the last week of school. All right. Okay, whoops, four. So it's a long, it's a long ways away, but I, but what I want you to do first is pick a time period and then email your choice. No, I'm gonna have you submit it, I said on a page. Through Canvas. So you'll see it all on Canvas, okay? All right, this is the first thing. Right? Pick a time period, make it narrow, and submit your choice in Canvas. You will have a rubric to follow where you will look at a time period, what came before, what came after, see it in a context. You'll have images from the time period to present. You will have a redrawing to explain. You will work with a partner. So you're not doing it by yourself, okay? Uh, and you can split it up any way you want. So you can make an outline together. Some of you can collect the research that comes before, some can collect the research that come after. One can do the male redrawing, one can do the female redrawing. You can both share in the sharing of research, the images, and this will probably be best done as a Google slide. And we will share it in class and on some other way so that everyone can see it. Now, let me think, I think that might have to be a discussion. So we'll take a look at that. I'll have to find some tech technology about that, okay? Cara, is that helpful? 
Yes, very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Is that any other questions about this? You will get more information. And again, this is something else I can put in its own module. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so the first one to pick a time period is that individual. Yes. Oh, okay. So you're you're picking a time period. You're submitting it to me through Canvas. My history in doing something like this is that there will be people that will pick the same time period. So those people who, uh, there's gonna be a way that you wait it. So basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna give me three choices. You're number one, you're number two, number three. And then I will match you together with someone who likes the choices that you like, okay? So that, you're, that you won't be working in a time period that you hate. And then we'll see how that goes. So I'm gonna have that submission right away so that we can, it'll be Monday so that we can figure out how um, we can pair you up with someone who has a similar choice, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Now, for the final design project, um, I want it to incorporate some kind of fantasy. So I have often done a Midsummer Night's Dream, but I'm sick of doing that play. So I'm giving you a voting, we're, we're a democracy, a voting idea. How many of you, and show hands, Kara, you, what, you don't, you're good with that or not good? You're giving me thumbs up. Oh, that was for some. The thing okay. previously. So this is a voting thing. Everybody get your hands on your reactions or on your uh, participant page, whichever. So Midsummer Night's Dream is a Shakespeare play. How many of you know Midsummer Night's Dream? Show me yes or thumbs up. Okay, so I have one does not know Midsummer Night's Dream, meaning never familiar with it or not never read it, never saw a movie. There is a movie of it, by the way kind of a, oh no, yeah, there's several movies of it. So um, there's even a movie, I think, by Julie Taymor, which is very interesting. Um, all right. I just thought, I'm not so sure about reading a Shakespeare. So then, but, but here's the thing that I love about Shakespeare is there's always, there's always groups of people they can look at. So we could design six characters or eight characters and represent the whole play. And that's my favorite thing. People who know me know I love the, I love seeing the whole play. I want, your, I want you to always think about the whole context of the piece. So now, of course, I have this the wrong stupid way. Hmm. I'll go to my other, my cheat board right here. And so here's the thing about Shakespeare that's good. Is that, you know, Shakespeare generally, all the plays can be divided into three. The characters are basically three groups. So there's the, um, you know, there's the royals, the rustics, and the other. And in this play, it's the fairies. Okay, these guys are sometimes called the mechanicals. This would be the king and the queen. Of course, we have a king and a queen down here too. This would be the young lovers and the court. All right, so it's pretty easy to see how you can divide this up and you can get eight characters by doing, let's say we're gonna do three of these, two of these and three of these, and you can see the whole play. Okay, so there's a fantasy element because of the fairies that people don't see. And Ariel, there will be uh, bottom is turned into a donkey. So there's it's like, because Ariel the fairy turns him into a donkey and 
and you have to figure out how to do that. So there's also some kind of complication. So there's, there's being able to see the different characters and then we have a complication which makes it a fun or terrifying design project. Mostly I'm terrified all the time, but so, you know, that's, that's the plus of Midsummer Night's Dream. This is the way that I work. So here's another thing. My other play These are my kids' drawings you can't see on here. My other play is for Return to the Forbidden Planet. So what's interesting about this play? It's a musical. It has 1950s music. But it's set in outer space. Well, it's on a rocket. It's on a spaceship. So there are humans. There are, uh, it's ba roughly based on the Tempest. So when the humans land on this planet, there are the planet uh, people. And then we have the other. And in this particular play, we have a robot and a monster. And it, as I said, it's based on Forbidden Planet. That's this one. They're returning to the Forbidden Planet. And it's based on The Tempest, which is also a Shakespeare play. So I propose these two ideas. We have the traditional uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. We have to read the play in Old English. And, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't matter if you've done it before. I had to design this play four times. So wait, more than that, it, it's a classic, but you do have to read the Shakespeare and you have to figure out what characters and we'll do all the same thing that we're doing for Lion in Winter. And with Return to Forbidden Planet, we have music and we have, which also is a complication, but it's good to design for musicals. So you have a time to think about that. It is set in a time period. It is actually based on a movie called Forbidden Planet. So that's a 1950s B sci-fi movie. So it's based on other material and it's also based on Shakespeare's The Tempest. In fact, there's Captain Pros there's Captain Prospero and Miranda are there. And dang it, I'm just losing my mind. Anyway, we're gonna look at a little bit of that. So does that pique your interest at all? Is there a third option? <laughs> all right. Uh, I don't have a third option. So you can send me a suggestion that meets all the requirements in that it can be divided into three different groups, including a fantasy element but it needs to be a script, a play, and not based on a Disney movie. Because maybe we're making a design for a great Disney movie. So yeah, I mean, if you wanna think about something like that, uh, let me know, but I'm thinking of going this direction. So I want you to think about it. 
there's there are so many things that influence um you know what happens in the future what happens in movies what happens in uh in popular society what happens what becomes what sets trends and sometimes it's very surprising and we uh, don't know why things happen the way that they do so it's just an idea to think about and see if you think that it is um I want you to work on something that is fun and work on something that gives you um, a stretch out of the idea from just working in a text-based play, which is what we've worked with, with both The Thin Man, which is set in a very specific and realistic period, and then Lion in Winter, which, which blends a lot of different historical facts together, kind of compresses time, moves things around, changes certain uh true facts even though the the people that they're talking about actually existed may not be exactly telling us the truth about them and um so i want you to think about something that just brings a little bit more fantasy into the world of of what you've designed so that's that's my thought and There's a lot of ways they can do it because it's uh, in terms of both plays, they can be in a wide variety of time periods. They can be in a wide variety of um, visual information. So, you know, I think they both fit the bill. So if you have a different idea that will fit all those things, I welcome it. And for now, we will, let's see if we can listen to one piece of music here. Oh no, this is, a, we're gonna listen to this one first. So hold on a sec. I don't know if we'll see it. Let me just, maybe I can just play it. Oh, darn. Oh, it just disappeared, shoot. Just a minute. So any thoughts? Just a, you don't have to, you do not have to uh, stick to it. I don't care. So I have a question. Yep. Um, if you're doing a sci-fi, uh, a sci-fi piece or whatever, but it's like from the fifties and it's just like their version of what like futurism looks like that you'd research? Uh, that's like, one thing that you do. Okay. Because there's no historical data for the future. Does that makes sense. That's right. That's right. No historical data for the future. So it's a, it is a pure design project. So and you can decide what you, you can decide what that is. I'm a little bit confused. Are we doing this based off of the play that we just read, or are we doing this based off like The Tempest or The Return to Forbidden Planet? So this is the final project. We're talking about something that's in the future, that's okay. due in May. We're not talking about The Lion in Winter. That's a whole okay. separate project. We talked about that. In my head. Huh? It was getting conflated in my head. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry. No problem. So Lion in Winter, that's going to be over and dead, done on March 19th, never going back to it right awesome okay cool. from there through the end of this semester you'll work on the last project this is play number three okay and so that's what we're what i'm bringing up to the group is what do you want play number three to be so from my point of view it needs to have this fantasy element mm -hmm. it needs to be able to be divided into multiple or multiple yet confined character groups so that you can design maybe eight of them and not have to design 40, but we can mm -hmm. still understand your entire concept for the play. So the shows that are on the board right now are the ones that are up for discussion right now? Those are the ones that I'm bringing up right now. And mm -hmm. Kara said, are those the only two? So I've, well, <laughs> I, 
uh, asked if that if you have a choice and it can meet the criteria, then I welcome that information. Hmm. I, I personally also do really like the Tempest. I think um, I think I think it could be a little bit hard to understand, but like having the like what is his name Caliban, and then like the it's a shipwreck, and it's like it's has like magic and um, weird. Yep love like in spontaneous love i think is if you are uh in ta 103 there is a huge tempest project with that no oh, cool are you in are you in theater appreciation no uh but uh my friend has told me a lot about th uh, theater appreciation yeah the tempest project um is a project where the the actual the entire class basically acts out the entire play and you do base it on that. Now, I also take the point that it can be a very misogynistic and racist play. And you can also, <laughs> I have my class in the Tempest read the Ami Césaire, which is Un Temp, Un Temp, and that is from the viewpoint of Caliban. Mm. So it's a different, it is a reworking of the Tempest. And there's a whole controversy right now regarding Shakespeare particularly in the high schools, which I think is one of the requirements is that are they gonna actually teach it or not? Because you have to teach it, of course, in its historical contents, but it is really, what does it celebrate? And yeah. what is the Tempest celebrating? And is the Tempest, you know, making Caliban? Does, I mean, it, it is, you can put it both ways. You can make Caliban very um, uninformed but he was able to learn English. You know, there's all kinds of things. We could talk about that for days. So uh, I'm leaning slightly away from that because it is one that is a major body of work that you study in another class. But I appreciate that. I appreciate you saying it because that's, and I'm glad because I'm the one that picked that for that class. And I think it is a good piece and it's appropriate in a literature class like theater appreciation. It was one of the first shows, like big shows that I ever did. Uh, we did Caliban, not like, uh, we did Caliban more of like, as in like it was some kind of sprite or like um, someone that like, was like more magical rather than like just uh, a native of the island. Because if you do take it that way, then it's, it's extremely racist <laughs> that this sorcerer just came and was like, you know what, you're going to be my servant now. And uh, well, it's certainly in the language. Yeah. You know that he does that. I mean, he releases he's he's so um, well. So there's a couple of things. One, I've done it with Caliban as a woman. I've done it where Prospero is a woman. And that's certainly the the uh, movie that was made from Julie Tamar had Prospero as a woman, Prospera. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of things that happen. Caliban has to, you know, threaten Miranda. I mean, threaten, uh, yeah, Miranda. Mm -hmm. I was just saying, wait, am I in the wrong play? And, um, and then Ariel has to be released from the tree. You know, there's, there's, and Prospero threatens both of them, both Ariel and, Pro and uh, Caliban in the language. So you would be changing the language, but since it's in public domain, you can do whatever you want to Shakespeare. I mean, that's the great thing about it. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I've gotten I've already gotten some suggestions via email, but I think we ought to. I'm I'm trying to get a little tiny YouTube for us to watch for Forbidden Planet. Let's see what this looks like. But I'm just bringing it up because I haven't decided. I mean, my my when we were starting this class was going to be been Summer Night's Dream, and then I took it out. So. There you go. Why did you get rid of Midsummer's Night Dream? I just think it's, I don't know. Wow, this is a really crazy. <laughs> Oh, 
visuals are terrible. It's so funny. She might as well have a fringe skirt on. This must be the robot. Let's see who did this. This must be some kind of a community theater. Let's see. As Miranda in return to the forbidden planet. And I don't see where it is. Huh, okay. Well, that wasn't a very good example. So, um, Kit, you were the one that said, why not this Midsummer Night's Dream? Yeah. Midsummer Night's Dream is one of the choices. Oh, I thought you said that you check it out. No, I, that's the two, that Midsummer Night's Dream and Forbidden Planet are the two plays that I'm talking about. Oh, oh, so I guess you just can... cut off on the board. I can't see Midsummer's Night's Dream. Oh no, here, yeah, we did this first, right? Return to the Forbidden Planet, but the first one we talked about is Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm, all right. <laughs> right? Because it is, the characters are, as with most Shakespeare, can be divided into three groups, which is, the, one of my requirements is that we can see the whole play in eight characters and that the, that the character groups are different enough and rich and developed enough that you will have style changes between them, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that summer was the first one I presented. Yeah. And then I was just saying, you know, is it time for something else? So that's why I brought up Forbidden Planet and maybe it's not time for that. So I'm giving you an opportunity to take a look. And if you have a, And if you have a choice, a better choice, please send it to me. And otherwise, just uh, I will put these up. I will put it up on an assignment page, Midsummer or Forbidden Planet, and I'll put some uh, materials up so you can listen to some of Forbidden Planet, not that horrible thing we just saw, which was frightening. I've actually done Forbidden Planet twice. It's a return to Forbidden Planet. I have done Tempest twice too, but it's um, it's really fun. It's one where the audience is literally up on their feet. So if you want to do a feel good thing, that's a feel good thing. Um, Midsummer, you know, it's been done thousands of times since 1605. So you know, it's been around a long time. It's been around a long time for a reason, and it's worth thinking about. it's worth thinking about. So I will put that up in an assignment page. It'll be like a, a one point assignment page, but that will be, or maybe it'll be, and you can weigh in. And if you don't wanna weigh in, you don't have to. All right, questions? <laughs> no worries. You can love whatever you want, you guys. It's totally fine. I actually find that sometimes I think you're more conservative than I am, even though I actually feel I'm quite conservative, but uh, uh, and non and traditional. But you know, it's just just um, and maybe that's just my jadedness because I've designed it so many times. But I always love what you do. The great thing about both uh, Midsummer you can design it from your own cultural background. You can put it wherever you want. And it's just, that's sort of the same. I think the criteria for both of them is the same. For Forbidden Planet and for Midsummer, you can put them, you can create the context however you want. So if you have a particular heritage of your own that you would like to bring into that, that can be around this piece. So Colby, when you're looking at what is the future and return to forbidden planet yes was based on what they thought a sci-fi what the future was going to be like in the 50s long before we'd ever gone to the moon and by the way wasn't that great that we had a landing that was so great during covid times we could we could appreciate that but um you know so you can design it and you should look to your own 
background to see if there's something that you want to bring in and do it from a perspective that would be uh, non-traditional, but very traditional for you. Sometimes I've done some plays where they had something called uh, metaphorically, all of the creatures, all of the, I'm trying to think what play this was, but, but the, whatever, let's just say the fairies were all animal based. So Oberon was a bald eagle and Titania was, well, reasonably she'd have to be something that would fight well with the bald eagle and be equally as powerful. So, you know, it'd be, you could set that in, everyone can have an animal metaphor. And even more than metaphorically, then the fairies could actually look like metaphors of the, they could actually look like the animal. Um, there's a, a couple of other things that you can have them, you know, it can be in any time period. I'm trying to think of something before I said the animal thing though, it's just in my mind. But there's any number of ways to explore the material. It can be very, very open. One way to find your own way to see something, for example, this character, Lear, this sketch, I had actually, someone actually wrote a question about a sketch and I said, yeah, you don't, they don't always have to be standing and still and whatever. This sketch is based on a picture of a football player. And it was someone who was actually tired and it was a great image to look to draw because again, we're drawing contemporary bodies and it is a position of someone who's fatigued and el this is, I'm using it as an elderly position as well, but it gives a very realistic viewpoint. We see the suede back, we see the, the legs. It gives a very realistic and contemporary body against which you can draw historical clothing. So, uh, or any clothing. And that's one thing that you wanna be thinking of when you're doing your redrawings or when you're designing anything. And especially when you're doing your redrawings, like you can't, you don't wanna draw the flatness of the Bayou tapestry. You wanna draw something that is, that's why you're gonna put the body on first and then you put the clothes around the body. So I'm sorry that other thought escaped me. So I'm gonna give you, this is my job. I'm giving you three things. You're gonna have a historical project, which will be its own module. Your line in winter, which will be its own module, but those will both have due dates so that you have one place where you go on modules to see them, just like we have one place to see the proportionate figure, okay? And then the final design, I'm just gonna stick that into um, this, uh, so I want to do on Sunday so I can stick it either into this week or next week and you'll vote by then so that you can uh, no I'm actually going to have that's you're going to vote on your historical project by Monday I'm going to have you vote on the historic the final design this week so that'll be in this week that'll be by Friday then on Wednesday we're going to review for the midterm and the midterm will be on Monday okay Questions? And we will stop recording.